Good morning, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I want to say a pleasant good morning to all of you watching from around the world. My name is Suzette Speaks. If I haven't had the pleasure to connect with you yet, I am a TV host, attorney, as well as podcast host here out of Fort Lauderdale, Florida. I'm hosting this new show as a part of this election cycle. It's called Voices and Votes. And we're talking to newsmakers like this gentleman sitting next to me. His name is Mr. George Odom Jr. He is an attorney here in Fort Lauderdale, and he's gonna talk to us about legal trends that have been occurring due to the COVID-19 pandemic. We want you to please like, please comment, please share. Let us know where you're watching from. Of course, this is a conversation. He is, uh, I think, a brilliant attorney, I would say. He founded his own law firm. Now he has joined with a partnership, and uh, we are going to learn a lot from him today. So y'all, please drop a comment. Don't be rude. Let us know you're watching. Welcome, Mr. George Odom Jr. Yay. Hey, hey, I did not have the clap track, but uh, we know everyone out there is watching and cheering again. Thank you, folks, for joining us. So George, how are you this morning? Good morning. Good morning, uh, uh, Suzette. And, and thank you uh, for having me as well as thank you for your uh, viewers and all those that are, are watching and viewing. And I'm, I'm, I'm doing well this morning. Wet, but I know I got you up early. And this is a, a broadcast powered by Jamaicans.com. It's an awesome website based in Miami, but it talks about all things Jamaican. Um, he's not. I happen to be. But we are going to talk a little bit more about law today. So I want you to first tell folks about who you are. For those who don't have the pleasure of having known you, you are a past president of the T.J. Reddick Bar Association here in Broward County. But tell us a little bit more about who George Odom is. Well, Suzette, my, uh, I guess history is, is not uh, very different from a lot of uh, young African-American and black men here in America to be completely candid. Uh, unfortunately, uh, in some sense, and fortunately in other senses. Uh, I'm a Florida native, born and raised in Jacksonville, Florida, uh, uh, primarily raised by a single mother, uh, humble beginnings, uh, had uh, my issues uh, as a youth, and luckily uh, there were, there were uh, not only with my family and my mother, but there was uh, a judge who ultimately gave me the inspiration to to do what uh, I'm seeking to continue to do in my career, uh, understanding that I had potential, understanding that uh, I did not have to fall into the uh, regular status quo of individuals that were around me, and that I could uh, that I was somebody, and that I could be be somebody extraordinary to to the people of Florida. Uh, I went into the United States Marine Corps, signed up at 17 years old. I wanted to set an example for my younger brother uh, and break that trend uh, in, in our family cycle. Uh, got out after eight years of um, uh, honorable service. I ultimately worked my way through undergraduate, started at community college, went to University of North Florida, then transitioned over to Florida Coastal School of Law. Uh, worked primarily my second and third L year there uh, to help not only my my family, but you know, to, to help myself as I went through law school and ultimately made my way down here with an offer from the public defender's office in spring of 2013 uh, to work with Howard Finkelstein as a public defender. Uh, I got into uh, the, the, the work of the criminal justice system because uh, I've, I've saw firsthand the disproportionate numbers of African Americans in the system, especially black men. Uh, I saw the concern that many had when it came to fairness, justice, and equality. And so, you know, I entered that realm with a passion and a zeal uh, to fight for what was fair and what was right until I ultimately went out on my own, as you mentioned earlier, and now partnering with uh, uh, my partner who is Jamaican, Ms. Dixon, mm -hmm. who has been a, an awesome, awesome uh, resource for me and an and, and aid to the firm. Uh, and that's where we stand today. Awesome. I, what an inspiring story, George, because I think there are a lot of people watching that need to see some good examples and some uh, not really. I don't think you're unique in the sense that there are a lot of men who overcome very, very tough odds, but we don't talk about them enough. 
So I think it's wonderful that you are uh, open and transparent about, yes, I was not a perfect kid, but here I am. Look at the man I am. And that I think is a good testament to what we need to do with our young people. We don't need to throw away the key, lock them up and, and put them away. We need to actually um, help cultivate them and, and have them open uh, their minds to new possibilities. So here you are, you earn a law degree. How was law school for you? Law school was tough and I'm going to be can candid with you. Uh, I entered law school not knowing much of anything, you know, uh, with, with the process and with mm -hmm. what I needed to to be looking for. Mm -hmm. So I, I didn't have, you know, my brother wasn't a lawyer. Or, I'm, I'm the first lawyer in my mother's side, father's side, first lawyer in the family, period. So it was very challenging because I had a learning curve that I had to to overcome and uh, didn't have many people that could help me in any way. I didn't know any lawyers, wasn't related to any lawyers. So I was learning everything off the cuff. But with hard work, dedication, perseverance, uh, I was able to ultimately overcome that obstacle. And, and, and the, the, if law school would have been like eight years, I probably would have graduated first in my class. <laughs> Uh oh, <laughs> by the time we figured it out, it was time to go. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> I love it. But I love the fact that you were the first. You didn't have a, a, a nearby role model, if you would, in your you know immediate circle to show you how. And that's, I think, something that is very important as far as a lesson for people that you don't have to necessarily know one to be one. You can still try and push yourself, even though, yes, there is a bit of a learning curve. But, you know, once uh, you 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 have that dream and you step into it, it is amazing how, you know, doors open up, mentors show up, people who are are supportive come into your life. So that's a wonderful uh, testament. So you move down here and uh, you take a job at the PD's office, the public defender's office. What was your experience like there? What was it like being a public defender? And if people don't know what a public defender is in the U.S. system, what is a public defender? So a public defender is basically the lawyer for persons who are de deemed indigent, i.e. who don't have enough money uh, or income to hire their own private attorney. Uh, the law uh, grants everyone the right to be in criminal court, the right to be represented by a competent counsel. So if you can't afford to hire your own attorney, that's where the public defender's office comes into play. Uh, some of it was eye opening for me. Well, let's let's do it this way. The work component of it was very challenging. Uh, we had very high caseloads. Uh, we were in trial very often. You had to learn again on the cuff. You you know, I came in during a time where you didn't I, I guess you could say you, it was trial baptism by fire. You were thrown into the lake and you had to sink or swim. So uh, and, and that was a very good learning tool because we had to work hard. We had to stay up late. I would leave the house at uh, 530 in the morning, not come home to nine, 930 at night, get home, eat, wake up, do it all again, because I was trying to, to catch up with all my cases, learn who my clients were, what the issues were, what the legal matters were. And, and when you're dealing with 250, 300 cases and some of those are multiple charges, it's very time consuming, but it's rewarding in the fact that you get to know so many people and you get to really understand uh, their personal scope and aspects of of life and how things transition to where they are by the time they got to you. So that was that was very challenging, but rewarding. And I had good people. I had good mentors there uh, that helped out um, some I won't mention for uh, uh various reasons uh due to you don't leave somebody's name out and somebody's feelings yeah. are gonna get hurt <laughs> well they, they 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 know who they are but they I, I had some I had great mentors Howard was great uh he gave me an opportunity uh, that uh helped propel me to where I, I am today so I'm grateful for Howard Finkelstein as well but that was that that was definitely um uh, rewarding the numbers and seeing the uh, those who were uh, I guess affected and involved most by the system, that wasn't so surprising because I came from an environment where I had seen that on a regular basis. I may not have seen them in the courtroom, but I've seen them you know, being arrested or whatever the case may be. So that wasn't as surprising uh, to me, but it did give me the fuel, additional fuel to, uh, and, and not just 
African Americans, blacks, whites, uh, when you're dealing with money, uh, oftentimes, some, sometimes, I'm not going to say oftentimes, uh, it, it, it appears that if you have the right z- number of zeros behind your income, that you may get more favorable treatment than others. So, you know, income equality is also a factor when dealing with, uh, I think, the justice system as well. And we have to look at that as well. So all of those things uh, were kind of not new to me, but to see how the process is played out uh, sometimes was disappointing. And oftentimes uh, I, I was you know, proud that the system worked the way it should have worked, but it's not perfect and no system is perfect. Absolutely. And, I, and it's interesting that you talk about your caseload and how busy you were as a public defender. And as you said, these are the attorneys that are paid for by the state that they're in that help represent people who are indigent or people who cannot afford an attorney. So how was the funding you think for the office? Because there is a lot, I know you can't comment on um, very specific cases and things like this, um, but do you think there needs to be more staff so that people get adequate representation? Or do you think with the resources you guys had, you were able to adequately represent um, these folks? I believe that anything we can do in this society that will help improve the, the system, uh, the justice system, uh, representation, et cetera, uh, is a plus across the board because when the, the, the scales are equal, you know, the, the, we, we refer to the lady uh, blind justice and then she, the, there are these scales and they are, the perception is that justice is blind and justice is equal. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, when we start talking about some of those factors I mentioned earlier, everybody's not on the same playing field for whatever right. reason, whether it's they're doing or not they're doing. So whatever we can do to make sure those scales are, are equal as represented in that image and that symbolism, I believe that society in, in a whole uh, would benefit. I think that's, uh, I would agree. Um, and. Uh, it's so hard sometimes to know what will help. Will more people help? Will better salaries help? Um, or more bodies, I should say, in the office help? Um, but like you said, anything that helps should really be applied and, and hopefully implemented so that people do get um, adequate representation, not only adequate, good representation, no matter what their income is. I agree with that wholeheartedly. So let's pivot a little bit to what we wanted to bring to the public's attention. I know a lot of you may not have interacted with the court system here in the United States, and some people have, but there has been a lot of changes due to COVID-19. And what I mean by that is there is a big trend going on where a lot of hearings are being held via webinar, via Zoom. You're not going into a courtroom, of course, because we cannot gather and we don't wanna pass this, this disease on to others, but you can literally be summoned and stay at home and be heard. So I know with this gentleman's uh, practice area, he has been one of those people who have been in and out of courtrooms in their house. <laughs> so <laughs> talk a little bit about how the pandemic has changed the practice of law. Well, from a personal perspective for Dixon and Odom, you know, it's been, again, you got your pluses and you have your minuses. We don't have to spend as much time traveling back and forth to the courthouse, uh, which saves the client's money because generally when we a charge we're, we're building, we call it portal to portal. Uh, from the time I have to leave to take care of your case, the house, et cetera, to the office is the, and then ultimately the conclusion of that, you know, clients are, are, are generally billed for it depending on the, the, the billing structure. So that helps the clients, that's a positive. Uh, it helps us because we can spend more time studying, researching, uh, et cetera, the, the facts and the law uh, for our client's case. That, that is also a, another positive. Then you start to get into some of the negatives. Uh, You may not have that direct contact as you normally would with the client where you have to see them, where you have to engage. Uh, And uh, there's something I like to call a technology gap. I didn't come up with it, uh, but that's the the term that I'm going to use today. A lot of people you learn don't have the resources, Internet, et cetera, to engage with you on a consistent basis, whether it be for hearing or just to to talk to them, Zoom, et cetera, whatever you're using. Uh, And so that causes a problem because it it, it makes representing them more difficult because you don't really want to meet with them because of 
the COVID-19 and you want to make sure that everybody's uh, safe. So, All right, so can I talk, excuse me for interrupting. Absolutely. I, I think that's a very excellent point that I don't think we've talked enough about because not only when it comes to the legal environment, but in doing business as a whole, I think many people assume that everyone in the United States has internet and everyone knows how to use it. And it seems for those who may be watching, oh my gosh, who does not know how to use the internet? But there's something that is real called the digital divide, where there are people who may not have the same exposure or level of education as others who may be say middle-class or so. Um, and they are struggling to keep up with this huge change. This has been a mammoth shift in how we do business, how we look for jobs, the jobs that we have, much less how we go to court. And it's something that I'm glad you're bringing up because even when it comes to technology and the learning from home now, I know a lot of parents are feeling this because if you don't know how to log on to the Zoom and if you don't get into the class on time and if you're not there to monitor, your kid can be completely lost along with you being completely lost. So exactly. it's something that we definitely have to consider when we're talking about specifically people who are representing themselves. Those are called pro se litigants or people who just can't afford attorney and say, yes, I'm going to come on my own behalf. And we are assuming that they can deal with this technological challenge. So it's a very good point that you bring up. And sorry to interrupt, but I just wanted to kind of highlight that because I think assuming everyone can get online and get to the hearing, Absolutely. <laughs> then the real, the real work begins. But continue what you were saying. But yeah, that's a very, very huge assessment and, and a shift. No, and it's even with seniors. I mean, I, and I, I see it probably more from uh, def defendants because we do state and federal criminal uh, and some of them, quite frankly, just don't have the resources, uh, and some do, but a lot don't. Um, seniors, I represent, our firm has represented some seniors where they just, quite frankly, you, computer, internet, what are, Zoom, what are we talking about? So, you know, when they have a hearing and they need to log in, they're, they're, they're baffled as to how to even get on. If, if you know, a lot of them don't even really use the internet like that, so it, 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 it's, it's, it covers many, the many people. Across the board. Yep. Absolutely. Um, you got you. You then also into the previous question. You start to get into a, whether or not uh, uh, there has been in, in here in Broward. Uh, there's been a big push, and it, it appears to be successful. I can't speak on the statistics of it because that, that's not within my scope of knowledge. But a lot of the family law hearings are now being moved uh, in, in online. And it appears that those things are moving fairly successfully with, with no major issues. Uh, but you also uh, have to weigh into account that, uh, for example, there has been some discussion about moving criminal trials to, to Zoom. And of course, you have to keep in mind due process and balance that with the social distancing efforts of trying to keep people safe because when you're in a trial with jurors, see with family law, it's not a jury trial, it's a bench trial. And that basically means the judge becomes the trial of fact. So as long as you got the judge on, they're hearing all the information, they're hearing all the evidence, uh, and it's just your, the lawyers and of course the, the witnesses. With the jury trial, it becomes uh, a lot more complicated. Tricky. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because if any of us have ever been on a conference call, and uh, we, we, we like to multitask, let's put it that way. So you, you're, you're on this call with 10 people, uh, but how much of your attention are you really giving to that call being that it's just a conference call? Um, or if someone leaves uh, the video feed, there's been incidents in other states where a jury, criminal jury trial has been had and someone leaves and they're like off the camera for like seven minutes. Uh, not here in Florida, but it has happened in, in, in other states. Uh, so let me be clear. So this is a member of the jury. They are watching from their house and they are watching a trial. Get up, leave their seat, leave the Zoom, no longer on camera for seven minutes while the trial is going on and then come back. C That's correct. the problem. <laughs> That's well, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big problem because you don't know what they miss, what did they hear, what mm -hmm. they, they did not hear. And the whole basis of a jury trial is to be tried by your peers so that they can hear all the facts of the case right. and the evidence and, and make an ultimate determination. So, you know, whether or not we should move to criminal jury trials on Zoom or not, I, I have no position on the matter. But uh, though th that's just one thing that we really have to think about. 
uh, as lawyers and and the and the powers that be when uh, if deciding to or, or or trying to push in that direction for the the criminal jury trial. So you, you know you want to guard due process, you want to guard people's rights, and you want to keep people safe. And it's it's a difficult juggling uh, task, but we we will make it through. All right. I think that's very good points. And I know you can't take a position on it, but I would like everyone here to just think about that. If you were being tried for a crime that could remove um, your freedom, would you want to do it by Zoom? Would you want to be actually in a courtroom or would a Zoom trial allow you what he's calling due process, the right to be heard, to be uh, to confront your accuser? Um, you know, to be judged by a jury of your peers. Can that be done adequately? This is a, a huge issue right now for the legal minds across this country and across the world. Because again, COVID-19 doesn't seem to be going anywhere. So what do we do with all this backlog of cases? We had a backlog before, and now it's even more of a backlog due, um, unfortunately, to the pandemic. So um, Attorney uh, Odom, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about uh, how an individual can prepare if they are going to go to a hearing via Zoom. Now, of course, he's not going to give you legal advice, guys. If you need legal advice, you should seek an advice of an attorney. But he can give you general tips, um, non-specific to your situation, not specific to your case, about what you can do to prepare or to set a hearing via Zoom. Because I know a lot of folks are being challenged by, oh my gosh, I got this you know, notice in the mail. Or I should have a mediation, you know, especially when it comes to family court, almost everything goes to mediation first. So how do I know when the mediation is? How do I set the mediation? Where do I go? Um, so first of all, let's explain your practice areas and where you're, uh, what you're currently um, engaged in in terms of the type of cases. And then you can talk a little bit about if you're not represented by a lawyer, what is it that you should do to, to prepare yourself for meeting the judge online? So, so our firm handles uh, state and federal criminal civil litigation, personal injury, and family law. Now, my uh, Ms. Dixon handles uh, a bulk of the family law matters, uh, and I handle majority of the state uh, criminal, uh, state and federal criminal, as well as um, the personal injury cases. And I, and I do have a, a small uh, book of, of family law cases that, I, that I've taken on by special request. So uh, I, I've seen it from both sides it's, uh, on a fairly broad playing field as to how Zoom is utilized in, in, in a bulk of the, the, the cases involving the system, the justice system. For those who may not have an attorney, it becomes difficult. Here's one key thing I would say. If you go on to the 17th Judicial Circuit's website, the 17th Judicial Circuit's website, that's the circuit that we are in, and you look up the judges. Each judge, uh, I haven't found one that hasn't, uh, has a uh, division procedures link under their name, as well as a Zoom link under their name. That Zoom link is the link that they are using for their courtroom. So assuming you can get to the point where you have internet, you have a stable connection, you're able to log on and log in, if you need to know, for example, as long as you know your judge, for the most part, you should be able to go online, look up that judge, click on that link. And even maybe you lost the notice. Maybe you don't have the paperwork. You can go online, go on that website, click on that link. And as long as you have the, the time still, it will take you into that virtual courtroom. So that's one thing people definitely should know as a backup resource. If you're getting a notice in the mail, it should have the website on there as far as in the Zoom link, pretty much uh, everything except for a, a couple of minor cases like domestics, et cetera, injunctions. And when I say domestics, I meaning like if you're seeking injunction, et cetera, you can still go in the courthouse to get those. But as far as in the continuing proceedings of that hearing, it will be virtually. But mm -hmm. th that information should be on the paper notice. Uh, mediations, if they're doing a mediation, they should provide that information on the mediation notice, the, the login information. And even if you can't log in and you may not have the Internet, there should also be a call in number on that same piece of paper. So maybe you can't get on the Internet or you're having problems. You can at least still call in. Now, key thing to remember per uh, this circuit's uh, administrative order, if the judge can't see you and if only you're on the phone, 
then they can't take testimony from you because they don't know if it's really you. So you keep that in mind. If you're going to call in by phone, uh, but you expect to give some type of testimony on the record, then you need to make sure that you you have a a, a link that is uh, consistent and reliable, and you're in a place of privacy. You know these these matters. Uh, some of these matters are very delicate, so you don't want to be in a room with everybody and their cousin. Uh, and you, talking you, loud in the background. And talking loud in the background, you want to be. And I've I've walked into the post office uh, like a month ago, and the guy was on a, on his phone in the post office on a on a hearing in a hearing. And I'm like, yeah, you, it's probably not the best place you want to be giving you know, your business. But uh, you know, make sure you're in a private place. Make sure you're dressed accordingly. You know, just because you're on Zoom, don't mean you should not. I say prepare as if you had to go to court, at least from the bottom up, right? Assuming that we can't see the bottom down. Uh, prepare <laughs> as if you to Look, wear a tie. You want to you want to present yourself to be professional because, again, per, uh, uh, perception is everything to a lot of people. So you want to look professional. You want to look prepared. Uh, those those are just some key tips that I would give with, with anybody, not just pro se, but lawyers as well. Uh, anyone who who's seeking to uh, do a hearing on Zoom. I think those are some great tips to think about because I don't think people honestly give it the same type of uh, professionalism or formality that we should have because they're at home. But nothing has changed, guys. It's still a courtroom. It's virtual, but it's a courtroom. So you th should think of it as such. There's no amount of uh, preparation, as he said, formal dress. That is too much. We need you to look like you're coming to a courthouse um, so that obviously, you know, whether your judge is, um, you know, trying to be neutral or not, they're picking up on cues. Mm -hmm. So we want to make sure, you know, you're putting your best foot forward. I think that's some very good advice. Now, what do you think? How long will we, first of all, has this helped the backlog of cases? I, well, and before I go into that, remember the mute button. Ah. <laughs> I can't stress this. If you're not talking, put yourself on mute. You'd be surprised at what you may say uh, just naturally if you hear somebody say something. Mute yourself. Mute yourself. Now he knows he's lying. Yourself. You say right. that in the background? Oh, no. Right. <laughs> mute yourself. If you're not talking, mute yourself. We're laughing about it, folks, but this is very serious when it comes to legal proceedings. Absolutely. 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 Uh, has it helped? I, I don't know the exact numbers. Those would be in the possession of court administration and, and specifically probably the chief judge. Uh, I would imagine that it's at least moving the family law cases along because you, you're seeing a bulk of the online stuff being done in family law uh, just because of the, the setup of the cases and how they're structured. It, 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 it It's more conducive to this environment if if having to do it online obviously the criminal stuff is pretty much at a standstill no jury trials have been held since what march uh, uh late february uh mid-march there's a backlog there's there's a and i'm not sure what the plan is i'm not privy to those conversations but rest assured there's a major backlog in place uh, there and he, we will have to deal with it eventually once the, 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 the doors open or they decide the powers that be that they want to do it a, a, maybe online or whatever the case may be. Yeah, I have a question about that. So if you were waiting in jail and you have a criminal case, you're just waiting in jail. People are not being uh, released early or, or given probation or parole or anything like this. Or what, what's happening? Well, yes, go ahead, George. Well, well, uh, there has been some movement, uh, with, with, certain cases and bond hearings, there have been some, well, let's, let's do it this way. Magistrate court is still being held and that's always primarily been 
uh, well, not always, I shouldn't say that. Magistrate court is still going forward. So people are still getting being heard within 24 hours. They're still getting their bond assessments within uh, the appropriate uh, legal allotted time. For those that have maybe sitting in, in custody and they want a bond hearing, there are procedures that are being set up for that, and they have held some of those hearings. So that is moving along and getting, uh, I should say, more consistent as, as time uh, progresses. Uh, it's it's probably been the the most the most injury I would say probably has been to those who are just sitting waiting on a jury trial. You know their case is pretty much at a standstill. They are going to be going to trial. They want to go to trial. States ready, defense ready, but we can't have no trial. And so uh, they're, they're just kind of sitting and waiting to see what happens. I think those are the people who have been the most affected uh, by this pause or, or delay in, in jury trials. Wow. It's a lot to think about because again, you want justice to be served um, and you want the right to a speedy trial. Um, but there's so much to consider when it comes to the COVID-19 pandemic. And unfortunately, there's just been no solution as yet. People are still kind of figuring out what's the best way to deal with this. And we'd love to hear your opinion, guys. You guys have been quiet on my chat so far, but go ahead and comment. And let us know what your thoughts are when it comes to the legal environment. So we have a few minutes left here, and I'm going to ask um, Attorney Odom a few more questions, but we want to hear your questions. Um, he is in a position where he is looking to serve in higher office. I'm not going to have him necessarily give a stump speech here, but I do want to mention for myself that he is running for judge um, in Broward County, and he will be on the November 3rd ballot. So if you have not heard of him, check out his website and please, please give him consideration because we need good, solid, um, honest, uh, community minded people. So speaking of that, tell us a little bit more about you as a man. I know you are a family man and I know you have, you know, your values come from a, a variety of places. And I think it's a good thing to know more about the person as a whole because you understand a little bit more about how they think and why they think the way they do. So can you tell us a little bit more about, you know, your current life <laughs> and where, and where <laughs> you're growing from in terms of your strength and your, your mindset? I, I absolutely. That's a great question. And before I do that, I, I want to point out one big thing that has been a major discussion in, amongst my circle. These uh, more, this moratorium when it comes to landlords and tenants. Um, please be mindful that the moratorium does not excuse your obligations under your rent obligations. So once the moratorium lifts, all those months where individuals didn't have to pay their rent because of the moratorium, whether they be commercial or personal, uh, or, or, or personal, that money, those monies will become due. So just be mindful of that. Uh, and the same for land, you know, landlords are are not receiving those monies. And so they're being placed in a pinch as well. But just I, I, I want to throw that out there because I've talked to many people and they're like, oh, we, I don't have to pay. There's a there's a, a stay or moratorium. I'm like, well, you don't have to pay now, but that they're not erasing that obligation. They're just giving you time to bounce back, I guess, is the word I'll use. So keep that in mind. Uh, because that's there's probably going to be a lot of those ultimately again. Thank you for saying it. Thank you for saying it. Y'all not getting away from the rent payment. I'm just saying yeah. it. Let's just let's yeah. just be real. And again, we were taking it with all seriousness because there are people who are financially in dire straits. Yes. This is not a joke. This is more so um, for folks that might think they can get away with something and who need or do have the means to be paying. Be very careful. Be yes. very mindful that. Any moratorium, as he's saying, does not um, uh, relieve you from that payment obligation. Thank goodness, hopefully, we'll get more help from the federal level for the folks who genuinely can't afford to pay their rent. They've lost their jobs. They're 40 million plus people now without work. So this is very serious. So just, just keep that in mind. Very good point, George. Very good point. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. So a little bit about me, to be quite frank and, and out the gate, I, I'm a man of God. Uh, I wouldn't be here without him. Uh, I don't hide from it. Uh, I am thankful for all that uh, he has done for me and continues to do. 
Now, with that being said, I understand that there in the law, there is something called the separation of church and state. And no matter what a person believes, because all the persons that come into the courtroom are not Christians, neither Hindus, not Jews, every, you know, people have their own beliefs. And so you have to look at their situations on a case by case basis outside of your own personal beliefs uh, and, and focus solely on the law, uh, which which I have done as a lawyer and representing people and will continue to do in any capacity as long as uh, I, I'm a member of the Florida Bar, uh, member of New Mount Island Baptist Church, um, uh, Dr. Marcus D. Davison, great mentor of mine, uh, two children, a eight-year-old, nine-year-old boy. Uh, I didn't win the argument of the namesake argument, so his name is is, is not George. <laughs> uh, he's not a second or, or a third, I should say. Uh, Y'all still have time. Y'all still have time. Hello. Yeah. That's that's Suzette. That's ship sail. That you gotta you gotta <laughs> learn when the, when the some battles are, are not worth fighting. <laughs> um, and, and I don't think there will be a third coming anytime soon. Uh, and my youngest child, our youngest child, my daughter, uh, who's who's a beautiful young lady, and she thinks she's sixteen already. So I don't know what I'm going to do. With her. <laughs> but uh, you know, we we're regular folk. You know, we. You know, modest. Uh, I guess we, you would say middle class, uh, as far as social economic status. Uh, we we work in the community. I'm a, a member of the 100 Black Men of Greater Fort Lauderdale. I'm a, um, a member of the uh, Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. Uh, in in good standing, I say that to those brothers listening who not in good standing, get in good standing. All right, A five. All right, A five. Exactly. Uh, you know, community work, St. Jude's Hospital, Kiwanis Club member, uh, help with the dealer, the debate team. Uh, when I'm called upon to assist, I'm more than willing to assist them as well. Mentoring my future is now. You know, continue in, in any aspect. I try to give back, and always will try to give back as much as possible to help uplift this community. Is is the best that I know how. Uh, my wife's active herself uh, in the community. Um, she is also a member of uh, uh, Alpha Cap Alpha Sword Incorporated. Um, she's works for a nonprofit dealing with adoptions uh, with a great staff over there. Uh, so, you know, we just really are, you know, it's people say it and you hear it all the time about, oh, you know, community mind and community stuff, but we really live the life. We walk the walk, we talk the talk and we walk the walk. And it's not about trying to get anything back from anyone. It's simply about trying to make this place better than uh, what it was, uh, leaving it in a better place than when we got here, not to say it's in a bad place now, but we want to add something to it. And so we, we do what we can. We like to uh, go and travel as much as possible. That hasn't been very feasible in the last uh, year or two, but uh, we like to spend time together. My son and I, we like to fish. Uh, my, my daughter and, and, and wife, they just like to do their own thing without us, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, I saw that big smile that came on your face when you mentioned your wife. I th that's so beautiful. I just <laughs> love it. And I think yeah. it's really great to see that there are folks that, you know, as you say, don't just talk about community, live community. And you guys are our model couple when it comes to that. And then not that we, you know, expect y'all to be perfect. And we, I hate when people put people on pedestal and like all this pressure comes with it, mm -hmm. but you just being you, you know, shows, you know, how, much people can do for their community and in, in their give back. So it's great to see all of you, all of your um, activities and how you're showing your kids how um, they should be. Mm -hmm. and, and, so, and I, I'm sorry. And I, and I got to say, the Broward has been good to us uh, and, and across the board, and, you know, from the, the Caribbean community is, is embraced us. Um, uh, great folk. I've met some great folk and learned some things uh, 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 that I didn't know and, and some some dishes I've tried that I've never would have tried because of, you know, I'm from North Florida. Uh, the Hispanic community has been great to us. I, I mean, it's it's we've had a lot of people in Broward County and I won't start naming names, but they have embraced us. They've loved on us. 
and we just want to return that love. So uh, people like yourself, I, I mean, it's, it, we, we have really, we really feel like we, we, we're from Broward. We feel like we're from Broward. We, we, they've just really been a blessing to us. And so again, we just want to continue to, 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 to give, give back as much as we can. 